Hello, everyone. Welcome to Talk of the Town. I'm James Milan. We are here today with our state representative, Dave Rogers, who's in for a legislative update, which we always like to get regularly from our various legislators. So wanted to ask you first of all uh, for any um, things that you would like to highlight uh, of personal interest to you um, in the budget, things you were happy to see included, things that you're not happy to see funded at a high enough level. Just, just your general sure. reaction to this budget this Great. year. Great. Uh, well, as you mentioned, it's just concluded. So um, it was a great budget. Uh, one of the best, if not the best, since I joined the legislature seven years ago. Uh, and uh, as you and your viewers will know, obviously in 2008, 2009, we had the Great Recession, a huge downturn. And really one of the great untold stories of the Great Recession is the immense toll it took on state budgets. So unlike the federal government that can issue debt, treasury bills, treasury bonds, and um, uh, use deficit spending, <laughs> state, gov much. state governments cannot they have to have a balanced budget every year. So when the Great Recession hit, state budgets around the country, and certainly here in Massachusetts, took a massive hit. And almost all the key accounts, line items, right down the line, you name the public policy area, took a major cut. And it's really just now uh, in many respects that we're getting back to where we were and making increases from that time. So, uh, for instance, this year, the Department of Environmental Protection, which is a key line item I always push for, um, one of my top two or three priorities is environmental spending, got a 10% increase. It's a huge increase. That's we also got a big increase last year, too. Uh, and the DCR, the, the overseas state parks, another big increase. Um, Homelessness funding, which is another one of my top few priorities, got a big increase this year, 10% uh, for individual uh, homelessness. We, we fund line items for families that are homeless and individuals separately. So they both got a big increase. The MRVP, the Massachusetts Rental Voucher Program, uh, which helps low-income people mm -hmm. with housing, got a big increase. Uh, education. Uh, state aid to education is the biggest year-over-year um, -year increase, percentage increase, in, in two decades. Uh, and the biggest absolute increase, I think, ever in terms of the, just the absolute number, uh, which is over $200 million. So, um, And there are many other key initiatives that got funded. So right down the line, it's, it's an outstanding budget. And also there was some money uh, diverted to the so-called Rainy Day fund, fund, which is the Stabilization Fund. And we now have the third largest stabilization fund uh, in, in the country. Um, it turns out, I just read the other day, Alaska is one of the top two because they have oil mm -hmm. revenue. So mm -hmm. they have a large stabilization fund. And that's important because uh, if and when the next downturn comes, and one almost always comes sooner or later, it's a cushion against uh, uh, future uh, cuts. And so that's important. It's important also, frankly, for the bond markets. Mm -hmm. All the bond rating agencies that look at Massachusetts debt, we issue bonds to finance projects. Our borrowing costs are lower because we have uh, such a strong stabilization fund. So it was a great budget. And uh, Yeah, let me ask you, um, you've mentioned in some specific items going up 10%, which is a, a whopping amount yeah, um, in a year, uh, as you noted. So I'm wondering, is, is, is it just that there is that much more substantial a pool of money uh, available um, to the state from you know, revenues uh, coming in? Yes. Um, or is it that there are things that have been cut in, you know, correspondingly in order to provide more money for some of your, your priorities and, yeah. frankly, our priorities sure. when it comes to education and the environment, et cetera? Right. Well, it's more the former than the latter. It, 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 that's every, the good news. That's then. good news. So every year uh, there's the consensus revenue forecast, and that is the administration, the Baker administration, and their budget analysts and revenue people testify. And then, of course, budget analysts in the House and the Senate, um, there are hearings, um, obviously, there's forecasting um, uh, and, and financial projections and a, a look to try to determine how much revenue, state revenue, is likely to grow and then build a budget based on that consensus revenue forecast. Mm -hmm. 
uh, as it turns out this year, revenue came in higher than the consensus revenue forecast. So there was additional funds uh, to spend on key priorities. And so it was great news. And, um, um, you know, I think we really, I say this a lot, uh, what we're doing here at the state level is, is a welcome antidote to some of the, um, uh, the really deep challenges we face of what's going on at the federal level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the you know any little bit of good news at the state level. Obviously, as you said, is 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 always welcome, but particularly uh, in the current climate. Yeah, um, and I think there's more than a little bit of good news, and as we'll talk in our conversation today, mm -hmm. um, I just think I mean we can always do more. I'm always pushing to do more, uh, uh, but I also think we need to take note of the many victories we've had in the last two, four, six years at the state level on legislation and in the budget. I do want to make note of the fact that you have described it as a great budget and that, you know, in, in the years that I have been, uh, had the opportunity to speak to folks in positions such as yours, I just don't hear that very often. So well, that's, again, that's a I, again thing. I, I have to uh, quickly add that there's always more to do mm -hmm. and there's always more I wish we could do. So it's not so much, I don't want to characterize it as, gee, everything's perfect and we've satisfied every need and met every priority. Of course we haven't and, and we need to do more. Uh, and we can talk about that. Yes, and um, we are just about to. Yeah, but um, I think on balance, given some historical perspective, mm -hmm. this particular year's budget was very good. Great, so let us begin though, the, the harder part of the conversation to some degree, um, or at least one topic that uh, it was notably absent in your mentioning of a number of things that have, you know, either uh, been budgeted at a, at a higher level or just in which there seems like progress is being made. And um, what I would like to talk about is the MBTA and transportation more generally. Um, I don't know, um, and and I welcome you to let us know if uh, if you know budget uh, funds for the MBTA itself. Uh, were also increased in this particular budget or not. Um, but the, nevertheless, regardless of the answer to that, the issue with the MBTA, as everybody knows, um, is a seemingly a crucial and critical one. Um, and it fits into a general transportation challenge in Massachusetts that seems uh, almost perpetual at this point. Um, so what I'd like to ask you is we have spoken to lots of folks who say yes, who have identified what the problems are. Mm -hmm. We are particularly interested to know whether there are action, actionable steps um, that you are aware of, that you may be leading or sponsoring, that you can share with us um, to address not only the operational problems of the MBTA that we're all familiar with, mm -hmm. but this larger question of how are we going to move transportation in Massachusetts away from cars uh, in a more sustainable direction, et cetera? Yeah, well, great question. And uh, it's always at the top of mind for me in my role serving in the state legislature and has been ever since I got there. Uh, in fact, when I first ran, uh, I made transportation a central focus of my campaign, so much so that some of the folks who worked with me said, gee, you, you talk about transportation so much. Do you think you're overemphasizing it? And I said, no, because it's so central to uh, many different uh, aspects of our life here in the Commonwealth. Um, what I can tell you is um, in the House, uh, we've gone on record as saying we want to have a conversation probably this fall about revenue f to fund the T. And um, as your viewers may know, you may know there was supposed to be last year in 2018 on the ballot, the so-called millionaire's tax, which was a 4% surcharge on incomes above a million dollars. Uh, it was polling very well. Uh, of course, in the heat of a campaign, you don't know if ultimately it would have prevailed, but all the data tends to indicate that the particular way that question was framed for the voters, it had a, I would say, a substantial likelihood of prevailing. It certainly seems like it was a popular proposition. Yeah, and um, a group formed 
to litigate the matter, claiming that the way the question was worded, um, because it earmarked the money for transportation and education, was inappropriate because only the legislature has the power of the purse strings to decide exactly how the money would be spent. Mm -hmm. And they prevailed at our state Supreme Court, the Supreme Judicial Court. So the question was not put in front of the voters. We have advanced the question through the legislature this session, and we need to do it again, two times, meeting in constitutional convention and in a way that would be impervious to challenge. Um, so I'm not saying that revenue alone solves the T's problems, the MBTA's problems, because there are operational issues, management issues, but there have been so many studies of the T, including one I think led by the CEO of a Fortune 500 company. I think he was tapped to form a group and study it. There's been several exhaustive studies. I'm talking about 100 page studies complete with appendices and exhibits. And, um, and everyone who seriously studied it has said, to really solve the problems with the MBTA, you're going to need significant new revenue. And that's because the term of art used in the transportation world is state of good repair. And um, that means simply taking the, the switches, the, the track, the tunnel, uh, the parts that, frankly, the public doesn't see, um, the engineering, the infrastructure, to get it to a, a operational, fully functioning operational level, fix any defects, uh, is about $10 billion. So there's a state of good repair uh, deficit of about $10 billion. And that's not to expand. There's a lot of ideas kicking right. around in the state to expand our infrastructure and our public transportation. Putting to one side any... Uh, movement to expand public transportation just to get our current um, system up to a state of good repairs a lot of money and um, the governor you know the big reform we did for the governor it was really the governor's plan was to install another layer of management the mm -hmm. fiscal control board which we did and um, you know I think they've added some value in studying uh, the system and making improvements, recommendations for improvements and improvements, but uh, we're never going to solve this problem without new revenue and outstanding project managers to implement the changes we need to make. And so the House is going to take up that millionaire's tax or millionaire's proposal won't be on the ballot again until I believe 2022. Mm -hmm. So the House has come out publicly and said, we want to act now and have a conversation about revenue, probably this fall. And so I've been talking to my colleagues, including the chair of the Revenue Committee, including to the speaker, the majority leader, the chair of Ways and Means, and just all my other colleagues. And I think there's significant um, appetite to do it. Now, exactly what form it will take, what revenue, what fees. Would it be you know, the gas tax? Would it be the income tax? Would it be the sales tax? I have a proposal to increase the long-term capital gains tax, which would raise about a billion dollars. And the reason I favor that is because, frankly, um, it targets those at the very top of our income. I think the studies show 90% of it would be paid by those at the very top of our uh, economic ladder. Mm -hmm. But whatever, you know, there's a lot of ideas. Whatever we do, um, I think we can't, whatever other ideas people have for managerial efficiencies, operational improvements, innovations, um, you cannot have a serious conversation about building a 21st century transportation system if you're unwilling to talk about new revenue, which our governor has been unwilling to do. Mm -hmm. And um, so we're not waiting for the governor. Okay. We're going to act. So when you say there's an appetite, um, as far as you can perceive, within the House uh, for this, what you're really talking about when you say revenue, you're saying l let us raise taxes in order to find money in order to be able to begin to address these issues. Right. Taxes or fees. Mm -hmm. Got it. And so, again, we can expect that this conversation is going to be happening perhaps starting this fall, and then we'll see pending the results of that conversation. Also, I, I'm wondering, 
are you distinguishing on purpose between the House and the Senate, as in they may be have they may have different takes on this? Well, any revenue bill needs to originate in the House. Okay, that's constitutional. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. a rule. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's the way the system works. Mm -hmm. So, um, so you're not anticipating that necessarily the Senate is in a different place about this. You're just acknowledging that the way that this works, right. it begins in the House. You know you are in the House, and so you right. can speak uh, for, again, what the general sense of things is there. Exactly. Okay. Gotcha. Um, let, let me move on because there's a number of different topics we'd like to cover. Um, one of the things you mentioned, um, you know, you were talking about uh, state of good repair and how the public, that, that would go to things the public doesn't really see. Yeah. That reminds me of something else the public doesn't really see a lot of the time, is what exactly, uh, what committees, et cetera, our legislators are involved with. Sure. So, uh, people may or may not be aware of whatever committees you have either assumed chairmanship of or uh, or are an active participant on. So sure. why don't you share with us one or two of those um, and just where 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 things stand uh, with the business of those committees? Yeah. So for the first time ever this term, I'm in my fourth term. Uh, I was made chair of a committee, so I'm not on any other committees because I'm the chair sure. of one. Got it. And the way it works is when you come in, you're so you know you're new, you're so-called backbench legislator. You're you're, uh, and you're, you're learning you're, the ropes. You're learning the ropes, and, and you can be on three or four different committees. Got it. Eventually, the next step is to be made a vice chair of a committee, which I was, um, and um, I was promoted to another vice chair of a more senior committee, and then this this session promoted to be a chair, and that enables me to hire more staff. Um, and I'm chair of the Cannabis Policy Committee. So now that we have legal cannabis in the Commonwealth, um, there are a number of proposals to, now that it's being implemented, uh, there have been proposals to fix perceived problems mm -hmm. in, in the system as it's being implemented. And so I have about 70 bills, 60 to 70 bills, uh, probably all in by the time uh, the session concludes in front of the committee. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's exciting. It's daunting. It's a challenge. Uh, chairing a committee is a lot of work. I, I sort of joke. It's like the dog who, who catches the car. You know, there's the dog running, and you finally catch the car. And what do I do with the car? Right. I mean, um, it, you know, I think most members want to, over time, um, get promoted to be mm -hmm. a chair of a committee because it is it is um, a chance to really uh, dig deep on an issue and and um, study it in more depth. Uh, but it's also a tremendous amount of work. Mm -hmm. I've enjoyed it so far. It's been uh, it's been interesting. I have a great team helping me of staff, two lawyers, uh, research assistant, and uh, my chief of staff, uh, um, who I promoted. She's been with me for several years as a legislative aide. That's another great thing about being made a chair. Uh, I have um, a woman, Kira Arnott, my chief of staff, who's fantastic, and she was with me as a legislative aide. I could promote her mm -hmm. and also give opportunities to other people. And that, that's one of the things I love about my job is the chance to mentor younger people about government, about policy and law, and um, how, to, how to be effective. And so, um, you know, there are several key issues in front of the Cannabis Committee. I yeah, mean, I was going to say, that's a, that's a pretty high-profile committee in a sense. It is. I, 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 in a way, I, I leapfrogged some more what I would say entry-level committees to get this one right off the bat. I was one of the leading advocates for cannabis legalization in the state. Our governor opposed it. Our attorney general opposed it. The mayor of our largest city, Boston, opposed it. The, the leader of the body in which I serve, the Speaker of the House, opposed it. Sort of the, most of the political establishment opposed it, which is fine. I understand it's a controversial issue. I, I don't criticize them at all mm -hmm. for, for being opposed. And it's also a delicate issue for people in public office, frankly. Mm -hmm. So I, I get the opposition. But I was, I was a leading proponent. In fact, I introduced legislation to legalize it, knowing it would, wouldn't go anywhere in, in the legislature, but as a way to kickstart a conversation, mm -hmm. to have, have an uh, open, honest debate about the pros and cons. And um, got some publicity there, and then I it didn't advance, so then uh, groups put it on the ballot. And I was out front debating 
and it was fun. I was on TV and radio, Greater Boston with Jim Browdy, and on Herald Radio, mm -hmm. and debating my colleagues, Senator Jason Lewis of uh, Winchester, mm -hmm. who was an opponent, and we had a really vigorous debate, and um, it was fun to be a part of that. And in the end, you know, it passed by a pretty healthy margin. Right, I was gonna say, it's a, it, it seems like one of those instances where, you know, the legislature is not exact, you know, the, the attitude within the legislature may not mirror that within the public. And, you right, know, the and public again, to be their, fair to my work. colleagues, it's, you know, it's very controversial, it's very hot button. Mm -hmm. One thing that I've sort of opened my eyes is, actually being an office holder, which I never was most of my career. I love politics and followed it, but I, when you're in the job, you're aware in a way that if you're not in the job, some of the, the pressures that come to bear and, and also how infinitely complex most public policy questions are. Mm -hmm. People want a simple bumper sticker slogan, a pithy response. Uh, most public policy questions are, are thorny, nettlesome, difficult questions that have pros and cons. Sometimes advocates for one side will come in and I taking notes and listening and sort of nodding my head and saying, wow, they're making some good points. And then advocates on the other side of the issue will come in and I'm sort of nodding my head and taking mm -hmm. notes. Because the truth is, um, if we can come away from the passions of the moments through which we're living and our own biases and try to almost detach and have a calm, neutral, analytical framework to look at these problems, not all, but most public policy questions have pros and cons on both sides, and you're trying to thread the needle mm -hmm. and find sensible outcome for challenging questions. And that's also uh, true of, of cannabis. Um, and so um, I don't begrudge the opponents. Right. I get that people were opposed and had concerns about their community and the impact this would have on mm -hmm. our society. Um, but uh, I was for it, I think, taking it out of the shadows, out of the criminal syndicates, taxing it, regulating it carefully just makes more sense. And the voters agreed. Mm -hmm. And so now we have a lot of bills pending to sort of uh, make some changes as it's being evolving and rolling out to the right. public. You were, you were mentioning perceived problems, but I'm wondering if there are things that you would acknowledge are actual problems um, that, you know, that have come to come to light because as things start to roll out, you realize, hmm, we've got to do something about this or that. Yeah, well, I, I filed a bill to do with something called host community agreements. Before you can open a retail cannabis dispensary, you must, before you can even apply to the CCC, which is the state regulatory agency, the Cannabis Control Commission, you must enter in a host community agreement with the local community where you plan to operate. So if someone wants to come into Arlington, or any town mm -hmm. or city, you must enter into a negotiation and actually sign a contract, an agreement with the town or the city. And the law provides that you can charge or put in the host community agreement up to 3% of gross sales of the business. That is a community impact fee to offset costs that are related to having the business in your community. Cities and towns can also impose a 3% local tax so there's a 17% state tax. The sales tax and excise fee adds up to 17. But communities can charge a 3% local tax, so they can get 3% of gross sales in the host community agreement and another 3% essentially of gross sales through a local sales tax. That's 6%, triple what was in the voter approved initiative at the ballot in 2016. So we in the legislature to incentivize cities and towns and give them revenue uh, that they can use for, for offsetting the costs and for local projects um, up to 6%, which is a lot. But that hasn't been enough for some cities and towns who have, um, some would argue, seen an opportunity to ask these operators for even more money. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing these host community agreements that have um, another 1% or another 2% or can you give to local you know, philanthropic activities, local charities? Um, and some believe that goes beyond the law. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, um, you know, we do live in an entrepreneurial capitalist society where uh, business people, men and women take risks. They wanna go into this business, which is now legal. What other business 
If you want to open a convenience store, do I have to give you 6% and then more? Mm -hmm. uh, if I want to open a gas station, if I want to open a bakery or any other business. And so the question becomes, how much is enough? And is it fair to these entrepreneurs, some of whom are well fin financed, but others of whom are not? And the other issue it presents is if for the reason I supported the law was sort of a social equity or social justice. I think people getting locked up, people having their lives disrupted um, was terrible. That was the reason to legalize it. I really didn't legalize it because I wanted to see, for business reasons, for commercial reasons, I, it's fine that commerce is going to go on. Right. It wasn't where I was coming from. I just thought it from a social justice perspective. But now that it is going to be a substantial business, there's the question of how do we get those disproportionately harmed by the war on drugs, by, by our previous laws, into this business so they can create jobs um, and they can be successful in this new business. And if wealthy, well-capitalized companies can pay these extra fees to cities and towns, does that hurt the smaller entrepreneur, who perhaps is a woman-owned or minority-owned, from getting into this new business? So um, we're going to have, we've had a hearing. It was packed. Um, you can imagine, say, the Mass Municipal Association, they, they don't want any limits. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but most of the testimony we heard is from people who said, yes, we, it's unfair to gouge cannabis operators. It's, it's, it's not consistent with a free market. It's unfair. It's not consistent with the law. And so that's just one example. I have 70 bills in front of the committee. That's just one example of the kind of right. legis uh, legislative ideas that are kicking around. And um, I do think we're probably going to have to act in some way on this. But I'm one of 160. I have to talk to all the other members, talk to the other members of my committee, uh, to convince them of whatever course of action I think is wise. And, um, and then, of course, the Senate. Um, my Senate co-chair, Sonia Chang-Diaz, the, the, she'll be looking at this. And we've, uh, we've had a lot of interesting, fruitful conversations. Um, so it's been also, while in, also important and take incredibly seriously the obligation, it's also interesting for me uh, in terms of um, being a lawyer, uh, having an economics background, to wrestle with some of these questions as, yeah. cha as chair of a committee. Yeah, I th that, that's tremendously interesting, I think, uh, as, as, as a challenge moving forward. And, you know, the early signs have definitely been that, uh, as you have already mentioned, uh, it does look like people who are disproportionately affected by the harm that has been, you know, attendant to this entire issue over the last 20 years are not getting a fair shake right now in terms of beginning these businesses, et cetera. It seems right. like it's, it is the well-heeled uh, who, are, who are deriving the early advantage here. So we'll have to see how this plays Point out. Point well taken. I mean, it's not opening a lemonade stand. It's a capital intensive. It's very expensive to get into this business. Mm -hmm. um, so, All right, well, let, let you know, I, I, I am tempted to talk about this for, uh, for even longer, but we've got, we've got a, sure. still a full agenda. Um, let me ask you um, uh, about a couple of local Arlington issues um, that uh, obviously the, the portion of Arlington that you represent is, includes East Arlington. And um, one of the, you know, one of the, one of the changes that is, that's happening um, in, in Arlington generally and in East Arlington for sure is an increasing influx of population, which of course has affected our budgets and our schools, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so there's also been zoning changes. I understand these are very local issues in a lot of ways, but I'm just wondering, uh, just interested in, in where you are at um, with this question of affordable housing, density, attracting commercial tax, you know, a, a greater commercial tax base, all these things that we are wrestling with in this town all the time. Just uh, don't have a chance to ask you often uh, for what your, your opinion is about that, where you see us going, where you'd like to see us going, et cetera. Great. Well, as you indicated in, in the question itself, uh, many of these issues are local issues. So zoning law is a local issue. Obviously, town meeting looked at some proposed zoning changes. Mm -hmm. So they truly are local issues, local elected officials, including an elected town meeting uh, and the board of select, uh, the select board, 
uh, they look at these issues. There are state level proposals, law, uh, bills proposed to change zoning, which would override local zoning. And um, that is complicated legislation. Um, and we do have an affordable housing crisis in the greater Boston area and throughout Massachusetts. Uh, I always hear, along with New York City and San Francisco, um, the greater Boston area is the third most expensive place to live in the country. I don't know if that's precisely correct. Maybe there's some other metro areas mm -hmm. that compete with Boston, although I'm not sure that's a, that's a distinction you want to compete for. But we, we live in a very expensive place. And it's um, a challenge also from, from a sort of a social justice perspective, if you will, or from having a, a more inclusive society where everyone has a chance to achieve the American dream and own their own home. But also it has implications for our economy, as uh, we do have a strong regional economy. But every year I read stories of young, uh, educated people who are leaving our state. That trend has changed a little recently, but people who leave, uh, even people with college degrees, because the cost of living here is so high. So it creates a tension, if you will, of how do you preserve the character of local communities? You know, um, you don't want a building boom to go on that's so um, extensive that it transforms the community in an unhealthy way, but also allow for more development so that it does ease the pressure on affordable housing. And that's sort of the tension um, in the discussion mm -hmm. and in the policy choices in front of us. Um, obviously, I'm, I'm open to ch changes at the state level that will boost affordable housing. And we've already undertaken a number of them. But when it gets to changes that would override local zoning law, uh, there, you know, I think that's why some of these bills haven't passed because state level officials come under pressure from local officials who who want to have who want to preserve local control mm -hmm. and we have, we have 351 cities and towns in the commonwealth there's a strong tradition in this state of local control i've lived in four states pennsylvania new york and maryland uh, maryland has very strong county government um, but here in massachusetts as much or more than anywhere i've lived the emphasis is on local control and so the cities and towns through the Mass Municipal Association and in other ways, have a lot of voice and a lot of influence uh, over state government. Uh, many elected officials in the state legislature served first on the select board or city council of their city or town. So they are aware and attuned to the challenges faced by local communities. Um, so that's sort of the state of play now. There are a couple major zoning uh, bills in front of the legislature. Um, and they're going to get a hearing. There'll be discussion, debate. Um, I think there's some momentum to do something, but the question becomes what and how far will we go? And are you inclined basically to honor that, that kind of long-held Massachusetts tradition of local control and therefore, you know, wanting to, like, like you said, honor the municipality's desire to, to retain uh, most of the zoning uh, power to themselves? It depends. Uh, it depends on the specific issue, the okay. specific proposal. I mean, I'm a state level policymaker. Um, I'm very responsive to my uh, local counterparts when I talk to members of the select board or city council, and frankly, just folks in the community. Uh, I'm very attuned to what the, is on their minds, and that's my job, to be a representative of their of their views. I also need to be mindful that we do have this affordable housing crisis that is a long-term threat to the success of our communities. And again, it's balancing local concerns about uh, too much development with, um, with the need for more housing. I mean, we're seeing an explosion of housing over near Alewife. Uh, I opposed the, uh, uh, the development that was in the Silver Maple Forest. Um, uh, I, you know, I just didn't think it was appropriate. Uh, but again, there's, there's the tension. And there were even people who would be natural allies on almost every other issue, affordable housing advocates and open space advocates and people worried about the floodplain who 
were on opposite sides of that issue because they're affordable housing advocates who are progressive on on every other issue we'd probably be in agreement but wanted that to go forward for the affordable housing piece right and you know that that actually takes me right into something else I wanted to ask you about and that's specifically the Mugar property that has been you know that is right in that area that you're talking about that is uh, been an ongoing issue here in Arlington for a number of years long time quieter recently because I, I think the sign all the signs are that this development is gonna you know the the town has done what it can to oppose the development, but it looks to you know to many of us like it's going to move forward. I'm wondering uh, whether you. Well, we think don't know 100 percent if that's true. Okay, so let's assume that it is for the purpose of this question. I'm just wondering whether you see any opportunities if that does move forward. Do you see any opportunities for the town through a negotiation, um, you know, with the developers, et cetera, you know? to get some, to, to have some good come from this. Um, sure, I think uh, if I'm opposed to it uh, vehemently, uh, almost everyone in the neighborhoods surrounding it are opposed to it. The town is opposed to it. I mean, uh, I think if you did a poll on it, you'd, you'd probably have 90% 90, 90 oppo uh, opposition. Uh, but if it were to go forward, then I think Certainly, community groups would have to negotiate with the developer over a series of things. Mm -hmm. You know, under 40B, they can bypass local zoning laws. But that doesn't mean through concerted advocacy, whether it's setbacks or height, or that the community can't say, look, we are the neighbors, we are the elected representatives for, in terms of the select board and others, and we want to have a conversation about what this development is going to look like. Mm -hmm. There's traffic issues, there's flooding issues, there's, there's, there's tons of issues related to that development. Well, I'm very curious, I mean, without getting too far into the weeds, um, you, you, your, your response would indicate that not only do you maintain that strong opposition that you've always had to the, to the development, but that you feel like that is so widespread that uh, you've, you've mentioned a figure 90%, whatever it is, an overwhelming percentage of folks around would be in opposition. Um, do you think that the, then that, that there really are some options for this not moving forward? Because my sense has been over the last couple of years uh, an increasing inevitability that it will happen. Perhaps I'm wrong and you can, you can enlighten. Me well, 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 there's been litigation, as you know. Um, uh, I think, I mean, any development that goes in any community, I've seen this in Cambridge, Belmont, local community groups can still organize and negotiate with the developer. And many developers, while pursuing profit and wanting to do their development, will at least engage in some constructive dialogue with the community. So. I guess my point is, if in the unfortunate event it becomes inevitable, there's no more legal options to stop it, then uh, a conversation has to happen to try to make it as make the impact as least detrimental as, as possible. Mm -hmm. Okay, fair enough. Thank you. Um, another thing that uh, that folks are concerned about right here in Arlington, and that I know that you've been involved with. Uh, along with mothers out front, um, is the the question of gas leaks um, mm -hmm. that are, you know, that there are still any number of such uh, un unplugged gas leaks uh, going on. Uh, where does that where does that issue stand as far as you're you're concerned? Well, we've passed three separate pieces of legislation in the legislature in three consecutive sessions to do with gas leaks. So. Um, there's been a lot of activity. Uh, one, to give one example, um, gas companies repair leaks uh, at the highest sense of urgency when it's a threat to public health and safety. So say it's near a building where an explosion or a, uh, the actual gas itself could cause harm, that becomes the priority. What about gas leaks that aren't near a building, wouldn't pose an imminent threat to public safety or human health, but which are hugely detrimental to the environment. So we passed a, a law that now gas companies need to identify those leaks and create a plan and a prioritization list to fix those. Um, so we're, we're taking a lot of action already. 
Um, and there are bills pending now to go even further, uh, which I co-sponsor. Uh, you know, so there's a lot of activity on the gas leak front. I mean, another one that we just did uh, was to require gas companies, uh, it's called um, lost and unaccounted for gas, which is the delta or the difference between gas that's supposed to be delivered to, company, to customers and the actual gas that's in the system. And we've required now uh, a report to the Department of Public Utilities that identifies that and sets a priority to address those issues. So there's a lot that's happened already so on can, gas So can I take from what you were just saying that, that that delta, that difference, means that there is has been in the past some amount of gas in that system um, outside or exceeding that which is apportioned to all of the customers that's just floating around and... and well, it's leaking. Uh, or leaking, yeah. right, and, and obviously up to no good in right. a sense. So this is about, this legislation is about identifying that, uh, whatever that volume is, and then I assume being, you know, treating right, creating it a report and an action plan. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, I want to, you know, we're, we're, we're close to, to closing here, but I did want to invite you, um, as you anticipate the upcoming legislative session, uh, to pick uh, one or two things that you would like uh, our audience to know that you will be championing um, that we may not have mentioned or, you know, stuff that is particularly of importance to you that may be coming up in this upcoming sure. session. Well, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, I filed over 40 pieces of legislation myself. I am uh, an activist legislator. Uh, uh, if you look at my colleagues, we have a lot of folks working hard on a lot of important issues, but I think you'd see the number of bills I filed and the areas I filed them in. Um, I, I have my hands in a lot of different issues that I'm trying to push forward. Uh, one of the big ones I file right now is the so-called right to counsel. Uh, for low-income people facing eviction. Some people call it the civil Gideon uh, because the Gideon is the famous Supreme Court decision that said that low-income criminal defendants have a right to a lawyer. That's in, obviously in the Miranda warning. If you cannot afford a lawyer, one will be appointed to you. Mm -hmm. What about low-income individuals in civil court where we know that um, we do have civil legal aid uh, through the Greater Boston Legal Services and other legal service organizations? But about two-thirds of people who qualify, who are low-income, cannot afford a lawyer, and facing very serious life circumstances are turned away. And that's wrong. Um, I, I often say, you know, the Pledge for Allegiance at the end, we all recite it as school children. We still do today sometimes. Um, we say, and justice for all at the end of it. And the truth is, in our society, and justice for all uh, rings hollow, rings untrue for, for many of our fellow citizens. So I filed a bill which would give a right to counsel to low-income individuals facing eviction. It turns out we've done some studies that in housing court, we have specialized housing courts in the Commonwealth, um, about 70 percent or more of landlords are represented by lawyer. About seven percent, one-tenth of that, of low-income uh, tenants are represented by counsel. And that's even with the efforts of the pro bono legal community lawyers in Boston who, and around the Commonwealth who, as part of their mission as being lawyers, um, give up their time freely to show up in housing court and represent these folks. There's still only 7% who have a lawyer. So I have a bill pending that would give a right to counsel. Uh, I think it has some momentum. This is the third time I filed it. And that's not uncommon uh, to create a new law uh, it's complex. There's a lot of moving piece parts, and uh, it can take years. And some of the bills I filed that are now law, it did take years, and it's no different with this. But we had a great hearing, um, with, which was packed. There's like 30 groups now that have rallied around the bill. It's taken a while to build up that momentum and that sort of coalition of groups that support it. And um, I'm hopeful to, to move the legislation. Uh, I've had some good conversations about it with, uh, with my colleagues. Another bill I filed, which has gotten some attention recently, I'm doing in conjunction with the American Civil Liberties Union, which is a moratorium on biometric surveillance or facial recognition software. 
you know, now in our modern society, almost everywhere we go, there are cameras or um, uh, people's images and likenesses, the way they walk, the way you move, it's being captured. And the question is, how, if at all, should law enforcement be able to use this software, this surveillance? And my bill says, let's press pause, let's put a moratorium on the use of biometric data until we can put some reasonable regulations in place. I'm not saying that law enforcement should never be able to use this uh, information um, because there may be valid reasons where law enforcement can make its case. Um, but to have it outside of any regulatory structure where there's no warrant required, it's come to light, I believe, that the state police are using the RMV, the Registry of Motor Vehicles database, uh, mining it for data in certain circumstances. And uh, that was unbeknownst to anyone. So you have a law enforcement agency in a democracy, in a free country, mining personal data of citizens, many of whom weren't accused of any civil or criminal violation. So what gives? Uh, again, I'm not saying I'm not opposed to law enforcement being able to use this data if there are sensible regulations in place. And I'll tell you, I have a once a month constituent email newsletter I send out where I really get into some of the details of bills that I filed or other what's going on in the budget, really everything I'm, I'm working on. And I, I very seldom, if ever, had more feedback, positive feedback about any bill I filed than that one. There's a lot of folks who live in our community who share my concern about this issue. Mm -hmm. So there's two uh, off, off uh, the top of my head of, of the many that I filed, and there are many more. Right. Um, and and um, I would encourage your viewers to sign up for my constituent email newsletter. You can email me at, at the State House, dave.rogers at mahouse.gov. Uh, and I, I don't bombard them with a ton of spam and a ton of uh, communications, but once a month you get an email about everything that I'm working on. Yep. Well, that sounds very promising for your constituents as a as a way of finding out even more than what they've been would be able to find out through this conversation and other outlets. Um, regarding this conversation, I do want to thank you again for taking the time to be here, but also uh, for the candor. Um, the energy and the forthrightness with which you answered the questions and also the fact that uh, you did so in plain English and we really appreciate it. <laughs> I think people will, who, who take the time to, to listen into the conversation, will really leave understanding a little bit more about the work you're doing, what your priorities are, and what progress has been made, what, 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 what victories are out there uh, to claim, and, and then also what challenges remain. So. Uh, Really, genuinely want to thank you for that, and um, and let, we'll let you get on with uh, what's left of a vacation, <laughs> um, and uh, and hope that you get all ready for the upcoming legislative session and tackle it great. Um, with great energy. Well, thank you. It's great to be here. I love my job, and uh, it's a really an honor to do it. And as I often say, um, to be moving uh, important legislation and budget items at the state level, at a time of so much um, difficulty, we'll say. And I'm being charitable. You're being very diplomatic, yes. I am. I'm not always quite so diplomatic, but for the purposes of our conversation, uh, what we're witnessing uh, at the federal level, uh, I never thought I'd see in my lifetime. I know many of your viewers probably share that view. Uh, we're living through a really challenging era. Uh, I believe that era will come to an end. I'll be working to make that happen. Uh, but for now, to have the honor and the privilege to be uh, improving social justice and uh, advancing um, economic opportunity and, and countless other things, uh, the biometric technology to protect civil liberties to the low income uh, uh, right to counsel to give those uh, on sort of the lower rung of the socioeconomic ladder a greater opportunity and, and protection. Um, it's the honor of a lifetime to be doing this work right now particularly this particular moment. All right. Well, thank you, sir. And that will wrap up today's conversation. On behalf of State Rep. Dave Rogers, uh, I'm James Milan. This is Talk of the Town. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time.